On this week's GCN Racing News Show, Paris-Roubaix. Always chaotic, but the two editions at the weekend threw up more plot twists than a Hollywood blockbuster. I'll be trying to make sense of everything that happened, but might well fail. I'll also be rounding up all the other pro racing from the week, and there was a lot, as well as letting you know what else we've got to look forward to this coming week. This week in the world of racing, we learned that stopping to change a wheel in the middle of a narrow cobblestone sector is probably not the smartest idea. Oh, you know, the team that is out, not so a good place to no. stop either with the peloton coming down behind them, the side of the road there like that. Just keep your fingers crossed, everybody, as they oh! make their way past. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank goodness nobody came down there. Uh, we also learned that unfortunately, spectators are still influencing the outcome of bike races. Oh, hearing of a crash, hearing of a crash, and there it is. Ooh. This is how it happened, oh my word. But that is why, Magnus, you cannot yep. count your chickens. Oh no, 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 you're too close, man. You've got to feel there for Eve Lampart, a potential podium placing thrown out of the window in an instant. Or maybe you don't feel for him. I have seen people saying that it was the fault of Lampart for not moving from his line to avoid the spectator. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You can leave them in the comments section down below. On to the rest of the race then, and it all kicked off way before we even got to a cobblestone. Crosswinds cut the peloton in two after just 50 k's of racing, and a number of big names had been caught napping at the back. Van der Poel, Van Aert, Askreen and Kung amongst them. At the other end of the scale, Ineos Grenadiers had every single one of their seven riders at the front, and upon hearing the news that so many rivals were on the wrong side of the split, they set to work in keeping the pace high. At a point, it did look quite risky for them, with a number of very strong riders doing little to no work in that front group. And with Ghana puncturing, then a number of their riders involved in or caught behind a crash, it suddenly looked like things were unravelling for them. But to be honest, it was hard to keep tabs on who was anywhere for a lot of the race, with groups splattered all over the road well in advance of the first five-star sector, the Trouet d'Arenberg. By that point, Matej Mohoric had already managed to go clear in a group of five, but behind him, Wout van Aert looked to be in trouble as he was pictured at the back of the main group. Understandable, given that he's been out with illness, but we later found out that he'd been one of the many people to suffer bad luck on the day, swapping to a teammate's bike before getting his own spare on the other side of that cobbled sector. With just under 80 k's to go, Van Aert got back on, and at that point, most of the main favorites were all in the same group. The problem they had, was that Mohoric, along with De Vriant of Antomarche and Pichon of Arcaire Samsic, were two minutes up the road. Who would do the chasing? Well, Ineos Grenadiers hit the front and brought the gap down slightly, but it was this move from Nathan van Hooydonk with 59 k's to go that really started eating into the gap of that leading trio. By the time Van Aert took it over, it was down to 90 seconds, and a group full of favourites started to take further chunks out of the lead. Dylan van Baal hit the front with 51 kilometres remaining and would spend eight kilometres on his own before being caught by Van Aert, Van der Poel and Kung. An early indication as to just how strong the Dutchman was on the day. A puncture for Mohoric with 37 k's remaining changed the dynamic of the race with just De Vriant out in front and the attacks came thick and fast from the group behind. Van Baal was at it again with 28 k's to go, bridging to a dangerous move of Mohoric and Seneschal, but it was another big effort and it took him three kilometers to close that gap. After catching his breath though, he wasted no time in making what turned out to be the race winning move. At 19 kilometers to go on the Camp van de Laarbe, Van Baal went in typical Van Baal fashion. No heroics, no stratospheric wattage bazooka, just smoothly turning the pedals to make a pace that nobody was able to follow. Now, pro cyclists always make things look far too easy, but Van Baal is on another level of smooth. Slowly but surely, the gap grew behind him, and there was nothing that anybody could do about it. Not Mohoric, not Van Aert, not Kung, not Van der Poel. So Van Baal entered the velodrome with enough time to sit up and celebrate for an entire lap, but he continued to press on the pedals, probably unwilling to believe what he was hearing on his race radio. But it was a brilliant and thoroughly deserving win for Van Baal, and you've got to say that Ineos Grenadiers played a blinder from start to finish yesterday, finally winning the race that has eluded them for the last 12 years. Now, to make the win even more prestigious, Van Baal covered the 258 kilometers in just five hours 
and 37 minutes, making it the fastest ever edition of the race at 45.8 kilometers per hour. Now that is just under 28 and a half miles per hour with 55 kilometers of cobblestones. And it could not have come at a better time for him. I mean, there is no bad time to win a monument in cycling, but with his Ineos Grenadiers contract ending at the end of the year and Jumbo Visma apparently sniffing around, he's just added a significant chunk of money to whatever contract he signs ahead of 2023. And after that performance, you gotta say he deserves it. It was dominant. He is the first solo victor since Nicky Terpstra in 2018, and it's the biggest winning margin since Fabian Cancellara's victory in 2010. It was also the third big one-day race win in a row for Ineos Grenadiers. They are a team who look like they might struggle to match the best at the Tour de France this year, but they're certainly a match for anyone at the Classics as things stand. This is what it meant to Team DS Kurt Bogarts. There's not much to say. It's all to the riders. It's too much. Whoa! <laughs> Yeah, I think that win meant quite a lot to the team. Uh, behind Van Baal, Wout van Aert surprised nobody by being strong enough to finish second despite his recent enforced rest. He will now line up at Liège, Baston Liège on Sunday and try and go one better there. Stefan Kung's strength and perseverance throughout the Classics campaign paid off with third on the day, but the ride of the day, for me at least, came from Tom de Vriant of Antomarche Wanty Gobert. He found himself at the front of the biggest one-day race of them all, leading solo for a time before getting caught but managing to hold on and cross the line in fourth place. And in fact, Antomarche has a whole lot to be proud about this spring. Yesterday, they managed to place six riders in the top 23. Now the World Tour relegation battle has been much talked about this year and that is a lot of UCI points that they've just swept up and certainly a lot more than Lotto Soudal, whose best finisher on the day was Philippe Gilbert in 30th place. Now another rider who can be very proud of yesterday is Bas Tietema, a very popular YouTuber uh, who this year is riding for Bingo. He crossed the line outside the time limit, but the important thing is he crossed it. And everyone who manages that at Paris-Roubaix is a hero in my eyes, so well done Bas. On to the women's now, the second edition of that race, and it couldn't have been much more in contrast to the inaugural race last year in terms of weather conditions. Dry and dusty, and whilst nothing seemed to go right for the men's Trek Segafredo team yesterday, their women nailed it on Saturday. Although not everything went to plan. World champion Elisa Balsamo was disqualified from the race after this sticky bottle, and here's what Magnus Baxter had to say about that on the post-race breakaway show. I think though, as a rider, you grab a hold of the bottle yeah. and you're expecting to be able to pull that, like give it a good tug on that bottle. That's kind of okay. But what happens is when the sport director don't let go of that bottle, you kind of end up hanging on to it and you don't want to let go of the bottle. So never. ultimately, no, no, you never, never let go of the bottle, do you? <laughs> so ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> ultimately I, I put that down to the sport director being, you know, wanting to get her back into the race. So it's grab a hold of the bottle, we'll give you a good, good tug on it and it was just way too long. Sticky bottle or not, she had the save of the day a few kilometers later. If that was me, I would have been down on the ground like a sack of potatoes. Uh, anyway, her subsequent DQ was a big blow to the team, but as it turned out, didn't have the negative impact that it could have. Trek still had numbers in the front of the race and they played them to perfection. Uh, Ellen van Dijk in particular was incredibly strong. Uh, she punctured midway through the race, but chased back on and still had a large influence on the outcome. Uh, Pre-race favorite Lotte Kopecky took off with 53 Ks to go with Bastianelli in her wheel. But once again, Trek were quick to respond, this time with Lucinda Brandt. With that group, though, not working particularly well together, the following group closed in, and that was where Elisa Longo Borghini made her move. Uh, she was followed initially by Elena Cicchini of SD Works and Emma Norsgaard of Movistar, so two very strong riders. So the fact that Longo Borghini was unable to drop them over the next cobblestone sector told us all that we needed to know about how strong she was on the day. From that point though, her lead did yo-yo. Up to 30 seconds, down to 10, back up to 25, down to 12, and back up to 30. So there must have been a few nervous moments for her as she was hearing that time gap on race radio. And she would certainly have been nervous when this happened on a right hander with 19 Ks to go. Chasing group behind this race, still very much alive. Ooh. Yeah. Ch 
change of direction after this corner as well. If Lee Helisa manages to make it around, then she did, but what a moment. <laughs> Thankfully, she held it up, and it was soon after that that the elastic properly snapped. She took a 30-second lead by the end of the final five-star sector at the Carrefour de Lab, and that had risen to 40 seconds by the time she entered the famous velodrome. That means that Trek Segafredo remained unbeaten in the women's Paris-Roubaix. A great ride, and another big win on the palmares of Elisa longo Borghini. She's never a prolific winner, but when she does win, she wins big. Talking of prolific winners, though, you have got to feel for the GOAT, Mariana Voss, who had Paris Roubaix as her big target for the spring, only to not even make the start line due to a positive COVID test on the morning of the race. A huge disappointment, not just for her, but for the whole race and everybody watching on. We feel for you, Marianne, but we have no doubt you'll be back here riding for the win next year. Uh, here was the top 10 from that race. Lotta Kopecky and SD Works having to set up a second place after a couple of questionable tactical decisions on the day. Uh, Brandt securing another step on the podium for Trek in third. Shabby took Canyon Sram's best result in fourth place, whilst Cavalli came back from a puncture to take fifth. A special mention too to Pfeiffer Georgie of DSM in night, by far the youngest rider in the top 10 at 21 years of age, and to Sarah Tizit WNT Sandra Alonso, who did a brilliant ride to take 10th. Meanwhile, at Brabant's appeal on Wednesday, things did go right for SD Works. Uh, Demi Vollering, who chose to skip Paris-Roubaix in favour of concentrating on the Ardennes Classics, followed a move by Paulina Royakers with 28 k's to go and managed to distance her on the final ascent of the Mockerstrat 20 k's later. So no photo finish for her this time around at the race. And in fact, that was the first time she's ever won a bike race solo. Do not be surprised if we see many more. There was also a solo victory in the men's race. 19-year-old Magnus Sheffield of the Ineos Grenadiers underlined his massive potential in the classics by winning a semi-classic. Uh, the team had three riders in a small front group with Ben Turner and Tom Pidcock, and they used that to their advantage in the finale. There was little that the others in the group could do to respond to Sheffield's attack, including a frustrated Remco Evenepoel, who was left even more frustrated at the finish line after being cut up by Tim Wellens, who was later relegated to last place in that group. That said, I thought Avon and Paul gave a really good interview after the race. Here's what he had to say. I didn't know that today was a cyclocross of Uvarez. I thought it was a road race, but it looked like it was a cyclocross race today. Really slippery. I think uh, it was really hard to, to stay up the bike. It was really a, a big task to stay up on the bike and don't crash. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure the strongest rider won. Probably yes, because if you can still attack like this, you, uh, you are really strong. But the strongest team won, that's for sure. If you are three guys out of seven, you are... Uh, the strongest team and uh, on the cobbles I wasn't really <laughs> comfortable, uh, still fell the legs a bit, so uh, yeah, epic day. Yeah? Even Paul will be back in action at Flesh Wallon and Liege Baston Liege this week. Meanwhile, over in Turkey, we had a bit of a sprint fest over the first three stages. After Ewan's victory on stage one, another Australian, Caden Groves, took victory the following day. And on stage three, it was the turn of Jasper Philipson. Another Australian, Sam Wellsford, got Team DSM their first win of the season on stage five, whilst Ewan would go on to take a second win on stage six. But the GC was shaped on days four and five. Eduardo Sepulveda took the race lead by winning the first of those, but he, nor anybody else, were able to match Patrick Bevin two days later. New Zealander took a much needed win for the Israel Premier Tech squad, and with the final stage cancelled due to dangerous conditions, he would ultimately take his first ever career GC win. That came ahead of Jay Vine, runner-up for a second successive year, with Sepulveda hanging on to third. It was a race to forget for Arkea Samsic, though. Naira Quintana had a fall in stage two and would abandon two days later, whilst Nasser Buani was also forced to abandon after stage two when a spectator walked into the road, causing a number of riders to hit the deck very hard indeed. On to the Tour of Sicily now. Now we had sprint finish at the end of stage one with Matteo Malicelli taking a much needed victory whilst riding for the Italian national team. And Malicelli has barely raced this season because he was a part of the now defunct Gazprom Rusbello team. But I'm sure he'll be hoping that this win gives him a lifeline in the pro peloton. Damiano Caruso launched himself into the GC lead by winning stage two in front of Vincenzo Nibali, only for it to be snatched away from him the following day by 19-year-old Fran Mihaljevic, who triumphed from the early break. Uh, he would relinquish it on the fourth and final stage, though, with Caruso taking a second stage win, and with that, the GC. So, at the start of the 2021 season, Damiano Caruso had the grand total of two pro wins to his name. He's now got seven. Who says you can't become a team leader at the age of 34? 
Next up, Parry Camembert, where a group of five fought it out in the finale. After a flurry of attacks, the one that stuck came from Arkea Sam 6, Anthony Delaplace. That was the ninth win of the season for that squad. And we had two further one-day races in France over the last couple of days. Ben O'Connor taking the Tour Jura and Jesus Harada the classic Grand Besançon. Tip of the hat too to Brodie Chapman, who took the biggest win of her career at the Grand Prix Féminin de Chambéry. I had a feeling that a big win was on the cards for her. I will move on now to what we've got coming up on GCN Plus for you this week. And we have another monument for you this Sunday. Liège, Baston Liège, La Doyenne, the oldest of all the monuments. The women's race comes first with live coverage from 10.30 BST with the men starting at 12.30. Territory restrictions apply, but the good news from our end is that we have secured the rights to show the women's race in the USA. And the same goes for La Flèche Wallon on Wednesday. We'll have a new winner of the women's race because Anna van der Breggen, who's won it for the last seven years, has now retired. On the men's side of things, Alaphilippe and Valverde have shared seven of the last eight editions between them, the other winner being Mark Hirschi, who will be racing with Pogaccia and UAE, who missed out on the race last year due to a Covid positive within the team. On the stage race front, it's time to start thinking about the Giro d'Italia. The first Grand Tour of the season is now just two and a half weeks away. And this week, many of the GC favourites for the Giro will be taking part at the Tour of the Alps, which runs from today through to Friday. Thibaut Pino is there, along with Bilbao, Lopez, Port, Bardet, Lander, Carthy, Chavez and many others. Uh, that one is available to watch if you're in Europe, the US, Canada or the Asia Pacific, except for China, Japan and New Zealand. Also on for you tomorrow, we have the women's Ronde de Mousgrand, which is available in all territories. Right, one more bit of news before we wrap things up for this week. Tony Martin managed to raise €35,000 for the people of Ukraine by auctioning off his silver medal from the London Olympic time trial. But in a twist to the plot, the person who won the auction, Fitline, donated the medal back to Tony. Where it belongs, they said. How cool is that? Right, that is all for now, but I shall see you very soon. Hope you had a good Easter. Bye for now.